Hi everyone, it is time for our daily read aloud. We're still reading packs. Yesterday when we read, we ended with a Peter chapter and Peter was telling Bola that he was ready to go. It's been a week, he feels strong enough. And she said, um, I'll just read what she said. She said, you are not ready. You sleep indoors dry and warm. You have clean water and someone cooks your food for you. But all right, tomorrow I will test you, 10 miles. You hike five miles, show me you can make camp on one leg and hike five miles back, then we'll talk. So Peter has something to prove to Vola so that he can finally leave. And think about what happened in the Pax chapter last. It was sad. Uh, Bristol and Runt followed him back to the army site and Runt accidentally tripped one of the landmine wires. And from what it sounded like, Runt has completely lost one of his legs. And that is where we've ended. So our first chapter today, chapter 21, is back to Pax. Pax watched Runt all night and into the next day from a bush not far away. He left only to soothe his burned lip in the cool river mud and make a meal of the small fish he found lying on the bank. His sense of smell returned, and whenever he woke from a fitful doze, he sniffed for Bristle and Runt to reassure himself that they were still alive. Bristle had dragged Brush to the fallen tree to shelter her brother and curled her body over his to keep him warm. She left him briefly a few times, and when she did, Pax quietly took her place beside Runt's motionless form. He was there when Runt finally woke with a whimper. Pax nuzzled Runt's shoulder to comfort him. Runt lifted his head. His eyes were clouded with pain and fear. He cried out again, and Bristle, who had been hunting nearby, trotted back to him. Pax pulled back respectful, but Bristle merely settled herself alongside her brother, her cheek beside his. Pax bent to Runt's wound and licked it cautiously, wary of Bristle's reaction. She watched him carefully, but did not object. Pax set to a thorough cleaning of the wound. Runt watched him with a trusting gaze and did not flinch. When Pax finished, he cleaned Runt's face and ears, and Bristle allowed it. When Runt had fallen asleep again, Pax stayed beside the two. Together, he and Bristle watched the activity of the camp. So I'm having a question right now as I'm reading. Um, it's seeming to me that Bristle is starting to accept Pax more, and I'm wondering if it is because he's helped out with their group of foxes so much. So I'm going to keep that question in my head as we read on. Although the humans did not return to the ruined part of the field, the scents were dangerous. When the wind was from the west, carrying the smell of burned land, the man seemed tense. The men seemed tense. More arrived at the camp with more machines. At the sudden growl of an engine, Bristle jumped. She laid her head back over her brothers. I must move him soon. Humans cannot scent. If we are hidden from view, we are safe. Bristle looked from him to the men. We are not safe if a single human is nearby. Bristle seemed lessened to Pax, as if a vital piece of her had disappeared. He knew that somehow the humans had taken it. My boy does not bring harm. He's not like them. He is not warsick. The warsick are full grown. He's still young. No, there's another difference. Pax was sure of this, but he was also confused. Over the past year, Peter had grown taller and stronger, and his voice had deepened. But more than that, his scent had changed. It was no longer the scent of a child. He is not young, but he is not warsick. The last day I saw him, he cared for me, although he himself was in pain. His eyes shed water. His eyes are wounded? Pax thought for a moment about the mystery of crying. No, when he is hurt in other places, his eyes shed water. It streams down his face. I think the pain is relieved by the flowing water, but his breath. He gulps for air as though the pain water may be drowning him. The vixen bent to lick more dried blood from her sleeping brother's haunch. After a while, she raised her gaze to Pax, and in it, Pax saw the terrible things that had been done to her family by humans. And then Pax understood something. Peter had thrown the toy into the woods that last day. The pain water had been flowing from his eyes, but he had thrown the toy, and he had not followed. My boy is not worse sick, but he has changed. He is now false acting. So what do you think Pax means by that? His boy is false acting. Right, from a fox's perspective, they don't understand what it means to lie. So if Peter is false acting, that means he is being deceptive or lying or trying to trick his fox, something he had never seen in his boy before. 
All right, chapter 22, back to Peter. Peter lit the four big lanterns hanging from the barn rafters. The tools, the sharpening wheel, the wall full of puppets, all glowed warm and cheerful in the cones of amber light. Even the hay shone like Rumpelstiltskin's gold. The barn looked reborn but familiar. He knew it like a home now. Home. As soon as he'd put on Volat's puppet show just another hour from now, he would finally be free to start out again. He lit the two small lanterns near the stage and lifted Sinbad from the wall. Showtime! The marionette's black eyes looked back at him blankly. Peter checked the joints, still amazed that Vola had taken the puppet apart just so he could learn its secrets. And suddenly, Vola's secret philosophy card flashed in his mind. I would have been a good teacher. She was right about that. He thought about how easily she suggested techniques in his drills without making a big deal of anything. How she had him watch while she carved, let him figure out things for himself. How she asked him questions about everything and didn't answer for him. But she was all wrong about being too dangerous to be near people. Anyone who knew her would tell her that. The problem was that no one knew her, except maybe him. He hung the marionette back on the wall. I think, Sinbad, I'm going to give you the night off. He went outside and fished a wrist-thick limb out of the brush pile. Back inside, he sawed off the ends and nailed on a base. He lashed the rock's tin bull nest to the top, then fixed it on the stage. Next, he lifted the sorceress puppet from its perch and unscrewed its left leg. Ready? Vola called out. Peter climbed the stack of hay bales he'd set up behind the stage and picked up the sorcerer's controls, surprised his hands weren't shaking, because suddenly everything he'd been so sure of an hour ago now seemed like a terrible idea. So why do you think he took off the puppet's leg? Who does that remind you of? Do you think he's maybe adding Vola into the play? I think he might be. And I'm wondering if Vola's going to like that or not. Let's find out. When she'd come into the barn, Vola had been wearing a long purple skirt instead of her overalls. And she had combed her hair, something Peter had never seen before. She had been astounded by the stage he'd built, and it hadn't been an act. You have the makings of a woodworker, she said. If I were in the market for an apprentice, I'd offer you the spot. In another few minutes, what would she think of him? It was too late for second guessing, though. Ready, he lied. Vola turned down the four overhead lanterns. Then Peter heard her drag a stool to the middle of the barn. This is the story of a girl, he said. He heard Vola take in a sharp breath, and then he didn't hear a sound after that. Not when he pulled the curtain and drew the sorceress up from the plank. Not when the seed corn he'd piled on her stomach like peaches spilled off. Not when he wrapped her in a camouflage t-shirt, tucked her hair into, clay, into a clay bowl helmet, and slid the stick into her hand as a rifle. Not when he had her shoot the rifle. Not when he unscrewed her leg. Not when he made her climb to the nest. Peter had expected a protest when he lit the nest on fire, but still Vola didn't make a sound. And just as he'd practiced, the fire was only a momentary flare as the handful of wood shavings in the bowl flashed up. Just enough time for him to take off the marionette's army uniform. He drew her up out of the nest and eased her to the stage, where he'd propped the child puppet beside his carved fox. He had her bend low to the child, then turn and stroke the fox. And then he pulled the curtain. So instead of telling the story from the soldier's book, he told the bowl a story. Uh, Peter hung the controls. He waited, but still there was only silence. He stretched to look over the stage. Vola stared straight ahead, right through him, her face as rigid as if it had been carved of wood. The tears streaming down her cheeks gleamed in the flickering light. Somehow they only served to make her look noble. I'm sorry, I only meant... You're not a grenade. You're good. You took me in. You're training me so I can get packs. Leave me alone, boy. Her voice was low and wire tight. Wait, I think it's stupid to waste your life out here for some kind of punishment. I mean, maybe that guy didn't even care about that book. Maybe he won it in a poker game the night before. Maybe what he cared about was, I don't know, Peter steeled himself. Being a teacher or something. At the word teacher, Vola shot her chin at him, but he didn't look away. Yeah, maybe he wanted to be a teacher, so maybe you should go do that for him. But you'll never know, so I think you should go out and live your life. 
I'm just saying that whatever bad thing wrecked you before, you could start over like the phoenix and... I know what you're saying. You're not wrong. But get out of here now. Leave me be. Peter started to argue, but his words withered at the sight of her sitting so still, head so high, tears now rolling down her neck. He wrapped the sorceress's con controls and climbed down from the hay bales and picked up his crutches. The silence of the barn felt enormous. Okay. Okay, he said, just trying to break it. The walk to the cabin in the dark took forever. Inside, a covered plate rested on the counter. He slumped against the doorframe, washed in guilt. Vola had made it up for him, from the dinner leftovers. You pick this chicken clean later tonight, you hear me? A fresh wave of guilt. She killed a chicken, something she didn't do often, because she wanted him to have more protein. Peter shoved off from the doorframe and stoop, scooped up a box of matches from beside the stove. He had no idea how long she'd stay out there, but when she came back, it wouldn't be to a cold, dark cabin. This much he could do for her. He lit all the lamps and then laid a fire just the way he'd seen Vola do it each night. Sitting there, watching it catch and, catch and grow, he replayed everything he'd said. It had all been true. Well, the part about that soldier maybe wanting to be a teacher had probably pushed it, but who knew? Maybe he had. No, there wasn't a single thing he hadn't meant to say, nothing he regretted. A gust blew down the chimney, threatening the fragile fire. He reached for another section of newspaper. As he crumpled it, a headline caught his eye. Forces prepare to engage. Area to be evacuated. He flattened the sheet and read. He studied the map, unbelieving. And then he grabbed his crutches and pegged out to the porch so fast that Francis scrambled from his nest and shot out into the night. He jammed his clothes into his pack, then looked around. The phoenix bracelet, the photo of his mother, and his mitten ball were the only things in his room. He propped the bracelet on the hammock where Vola would find it, dropped the other things into his pack, and swung up into the kitchen. Vola was just coming in. She hung her hat on the peg and looked over at the fire, then back at him, at his pack. He handed the sheet of newspaper to her. Vola scanned it, then looked up for explanation. He pointed at the map. The area they're closing off? He choked. That's only five miles from where I left Pax. Are you sure? It's a big area. I'm sure. See this empty place? It's an abandoned rope mill. It's got all these high stone walls. And it sits overlooking the river at the only place you can get across it. The rest is gorge. That's where they'll fight for the water. My friends and I used to play war at the mill. We said it was the perfect place for an ambush. We played war. I left Pax on the road leading up to it, thinking it would be... The word safe stuck in his throat. He shot up and lurched over to the pegs at the door to grab his sweatshirt. Stop. They're preparing for battle there. Don't be crazy. It's not crazy. It's right. I know it. I remember the, I remember the cheese. You asked what kind I liked and I didn't know. My father likes cheddar, so that's what we have. Maybe I used to like something else. It's like you said. I had that forgetting who you are disorder. I didn't remember what was wrong and what was wrong when I left Pax. But now I do. Now I need to, now I know I need to go there. I know that. All right, maybe so. But you're still on one leg, boy. It isn't possible. Look at this distance. Vola sat down with the map. No, I've wasted enough time. I'm not listening anymore. Hold on. Vola lifted the paper. You come over here. See something. Peter frowned, but he swung back over. Robert Johnson, bus driver friend I've been telling you about, who's been mailing your letters? See this spot here? She tapped the top left corner of the map in the article. That town is the final stop in his route. He passes there at 10 past 11, Tuesdays and Saturdays. And this is where he pulls up at the end of the night. What if I put you on that bus tomorrow? Seems like that would save you at least 250 miles, leave you about 40 to cover on your own. You listening now? Peter dropped his crutches and sank to the chair, jelly-legged with relief. You do that for me? Over 40 miles? That's nothing! No, 40 miles across woods and hills on crutches is not nothing. Three days at least, I'd figure. But it'll just about kill you. But I think you can do it. So you'll stay the night now. Deal? Peter took his hand and met her gaze. Deal. Looking at Vola, her face still tear-streaked from what had happened in the barn, he knew he couldn't leave things as broken as they were. 
and he didn't have much time to fix them. Deal, he said again, on three conditions. And that's the end of our chapter. So tomorrow we will find out what those three conditions are, and we will also get back into the story of Pax, Bristle, and Runt. Um, so far, Runt does not seem to be doing well. He's a little unresponsive to the other foxes, and his leg is gone. So we will see if Bristle and Pax are able to help him. I've got my fingers crossed. All right, Runt is one of my favorite characters. So, all right, we will be back tomorrow. Have a great day.